live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, and we'll plan it. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States. As we look around the globe in 144 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, products, and of course the leaders that are making a difference as we go through the 21st century. And we have a gentleman who's been working uh, since the 1980s in the country of China, throughout Asia and the African continent. It's looking at a new worldwide movement called Fusion Economics, how pragmatism is changing the world. This is uh, Lawrence J. Brom. He's the co-founder of the Himalayan and African Consensus, the publisher of the Fusion Economics, and sitting right beside me, a good friend who's been with us before, is uh, Chuck D. Vollmer. Charles is his formal name, author, founder of Jobonomics, and also of the Jobonomics blog and Chuck welcome well, thank glad you. to have you here Lawrence and welcome to you you came you. all the way from Tibet in China and uh, staying over in the United States and we're really glad to have you so welcome to the Emerald Planet thank you it's a pleasure to be here tell us a little bit about uh, fusion economics and just how does it uh, pragmatism changing the world well, have you ever had fusion cuisine? It's a little bit of Asia, it's a little bit of the West, and it's a little bit of mixing, but taking the best of all these things without worrying about what is right or wrong. And that's what fusion economics is, it's pragmatism. It's not socialism, it's not capitalism, it's taking the best of market, the best of planning. Uh, it's not about top down, it's not only about bottom up, it's about combining, it's purely pragmatism what works for an economy and what makes that economy work. Local people have the answers because they should know about their, their own economy and their own culture first. And that's why we have fusion economics. That's fantastic. And looking at all the various images you sent us, it really is a focus on what's going at the local level all the way down to the household. And that's something that's very important as far as Emerald Plant is concerned. And I know with uh, Chuck and his jobonomics, it's uh, very similar in that. And so it's good the three of us can all be together. Uh, what do you consider the special mission and the vision of fusion economics? Bring pragmatism back to economics. There's just been too much theory. There's been too many academics trying to win prizes. That's part of the problem. Economics is about trying to distribute resources in the most efficient way as possible to benefit the most people. And that's exactly what we're not doing. So it's really taking all of that theory and putting it aside and looking at pragmatic solutions. And again, that brings us right back to the community because people in their community know the problems they're facing. And more often than not, they have the solutions locally, not somebody from the outside. I often say, how could an IMF advisor go to a country and advise on village economics if that advisor has never spent a night in a village. I think that's really a key uh, point. And uh, you've been all over the world. I've been in 88 countries now, living, working, and uh, you know, traveling in those places. And each place, uh, there's similarities, but also there's unique uh, features to that. And also, as you try to develop in those areas, there's unique features that needs to be worked in to that whole thing, and we'll be talking about that. So, Lawrence, thank you for sharing. Chuck, why don't you ask us the next question? Sure. Uh, good seeing you again, Lawrence. Uh, I'd like to see your face to say soon. Uh, Lawrence, what is the uh, philosophical base for fusion economics, and uh, do you do see it as a true fusion with other uh, major uh, economic theories that evolved over the last uh, several centuries, or something totally separate? I think it's a departure from economic theory. You know, I really feel that we talk about communism or Marxism and socialism and capitalism. And frankly, I think, to tell you the truth, Deng Xiaoping buried all of that in the last century when he said it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white as long as it catches the mouse. I think it's that type of pragmatic approach. Sometimes you need planning. 
Sometimes you need market, sometimes you need more than the other. It's just like running a household. You've got to plan ahead, and sometimes there are things that you can't plan for. You just have to let them happen. And I think it's being able to take all of that economic theory and said it's contributed nicely, but step aside from it, pick and choose what works, and sometimes you need more and sometimes you need less. But in the end of the day, you're looking for a middle road, a path between the two. And that's what fusion economics is all about, just trying to make people's lives a little better, doing it in a practical, not a theoretical way. Now, the 30 years that you've had in China, it's exceptional what you've been doing there and the fact that you can actually work in Tibet and then, of course, you've been going across borders to Bhutan and Nepal and these very interesting dynamic societies and very ancient cultures. Uh, what have you learned from your 30 years working there that you've been able to put into fusion economics? Local wisdom. At the end of the day, people themselves have their own rules, their own culture. Culture is a reflection upon their own environment. And while we all have the same needs anywhere in the world, we all have the same needs, we all have the same wants. People are alike pretty much everywhere. However, geographical conditions, other situations that are relevant to the local locality affect the way people respond to that locality. And so you can't take culture and divorce it from economics. You can't take theoretical systems and apply them in a cookie cutter fashion like shock therapy. You really have to look at the culture. You know, I remember talking with Premier Zhu Rongji and I asked him once, the premier, former premier of China, what do you think about when you make an economic decision? He said the social psychology effect on a herd of sheep. Doesn't matter how good your theory is, if people don't respond to it, it's useless. And it's really about understanding the social psychology of people. And that gives you the economic results that can take you from one point to another, improve lives, protect the environment, and keep the community intact. Something we talked about when you were in Washington, D.C., and not just related to this interview right now, how have you been able to take the experiences, as you know, as you go up the mountains in places like to, uh, Tibet and Nepal, there are different cultures depending on what area you are as you go around the mountain. And uh, many cases I see from your climbing experience, you're going straight up the mountain. And so you're coming across various cultures and almost in some cases linguistic groups. How is that put into fusion economics? And what can you learn by the diversity just going up the mountain? I'm always learning. I'm never teaching. And wherever I go, whichever culture I find myself in, uh, the problems that are brought to the table that are being asked, you know, when I'm being asked to solve a problem, I look to them because they have their own knowledge base, they have their own wisdom, they have their own solutions. And if you bring something in that's outside of the context of their frame of looking at things, it's not going to work. So observation, listening, um, even when we pro provided a overall blueprint for China's uh, now very radical departure from hyper growth to now more quality growth for protection of the environment. I did it on the basis of the Chinese five elements, uh, things that people can relate to, they can hook on to. Again, people have the answers to their own questions. You just have to put the questions to them in the right way and those answers come out and then from that you can put together a solution. How do you think the uh, various societies that you're working with, Lawrence, blend this whole notion as far as economic planning, democracy, open communications, uh, even free enterprise or the development of new and different types of uh, businesses that blends in to allow people to really be a part of what you're talking about, but still feel like that they have ownership of the outcomes of what's going on through fusion economics? Well, fusion economics is about letting them have ownership. It's really, that's the whole point. And I think that, you know, when you travel around the world, you find really most places and cultures are not really hung up on this sort of notion that you're capitalist and democracy or you're planning and you're socialist. Um, people have already broken these ideas down. Uh, there's very little theoretical basis behind people trying to find solutions for their communities. 
I think there's the theories of the past are really behind us. People now are looking to try and say, how do we evolve our economy? How do we benefit more people? But how do we maintain the integrity of our community and our culture? And in particularly the part of the world that I work in, the environment is right there. It's right in your face. Uh, the hyper growth of China has left us with uh, you know, this terrible pollution and smog. People are now uh, responding against it. Uh, other areas I'm working at, the glaciers are already disappearing and rivers are flooding. So we're on the front lane, line of the fight against climate disruption. And I think that communities are just not worried about theory. Chuck, hearing what he has to say, how does that fit in with your jobonomics about working in communities? Because you've worked all over the world as well. And yes. you're an expert in the Middle East and places. So how does that actually fit into jobonomics and also working fusion economics? Well, I think the jobonomics, uh, we're focused on creating uh, U.S. jobs. Now, we've been asked to do overseas as well, but it, predominantly our plan is for uh, America. And uh, we focus at the base of the pyramid. We want to create about 20 million net new jobs over the next decade. And we focus on really three demographics, uh, women, uh, minorities, uh, new workforce, uh, workforce entrants, Gen Y and Gen Z, and actually uh, poor and underprivileged white males. So those are kind of our four areas. And as uh, Lawrence is saying, that they all have their own demographics and their own culture. And then if you look at it, especially in the inner cities or in the place of the uh, base of the economic pyramid, uh, we agree with uh, with fusion economics about how do you how do you blend these these uh, these new ideas. And, it, and quite frankly, what we're doing in the United States right now, uh, it, it's just not working for the, uh, the middle class. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and you've got an erosion of the middle class, and, uh, and you've got people just leaving the workforce. Uh, Lawrence, we got you back uh, about uh, 15, 20 seconds. What do you see for the expansion and development of fusion economics over the next 5, 10, 15 years? And we have to be so quick. It's already happening everywhere. People are going back to their communities. It's not about globalization. It's not about one cookie cutter model. And there's too much finance, too much capital at the level of arbitrage trading. We have to get capital to communities. And everywhere people realize the threat of climate change has given us a crisis. Yes, and thank you for uh, bringing all that out. Uh, this is Lawrence J. Brom. Sitting right beside me is Chuck Vollmer of Jobonomics. Thank you for being with us as we look over, talk about fusion economics as create the Emerald Planet. Osama bin Laden calls getting nuclear weapons a religious duty. Today, materials that can be used to make nuclear weapons are stored in more than 40 countries. Sometimes protected by just a chain link fence. Yet not enough is being done to lock down these materials before terrorists steal them. Why did we learn all this? My mother. My son. My sister-in-law were all murdered September 11th. Help protect America. Together we can. Please join us. The stem cell issue is being debated throughout the country. Truth is, most everyone has an opinion, even if they don't know the facts. Let's stop arguing and start really understanding the potential of stem cell research. For us and for millions of Americans living with disabilities, get the facts. Call 1-877-842-3442 for free information from the Stem Cell Research Foundation. That's 1-877-842-3442. Following the tragic events of September 11th, there have been hundreds of violent attacks against innocent Americans. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. Remember, please stop the hate. We're stronger when we are united. Remember. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. One nation. Under God. Indivisible. With liberty. And justice. For all. In America, there's either room for everyone, or it's not America. Don't pick the wrong fight. Let's keep America land of the free. Stop the hate. Planning a home renovation? Put this at the top of your to-do list. Because after 10 years, none of you are protected against tetanus and another potentially fatal disease, diphtheria. A minor injury, such as a cut or a scrape, can put you at risk for a tetanus infection. And while safety gear offers some protection, an up-to-date vaccination called the TD Booster is the best insurance against tetanus. 
So get the TD Booster. If it's been 10, do it again. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. and the United States. And we're looking for those thousand best practices and of course the leadership are making a difference as we go through the 21st century. By 2050, they're estimating we'll have about 9 billion people on the planet and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of the century. So how are we going to be able to take care of these people, but at the same time make them feel like that they're actually part of the solutions and we're increasing their quality of living and the style of life that they have so that they're actually contributing to the society within their own community, uh, within their region, and also the nation where they're living. And so we have a gentleman who's uh, coming to us. Actually, he's uh, been living over 30 years now in China. He's been specializing in the area called Tibet, as well as the border states uh, between China and India, like Bhutan, Sikkim, and Nepal. And so we have uh, Lawrence J. Brom, who is the co-founder of what's called the Himalayan and African Consensus. And uh, Lawrence, I'll have you talk a little bit about that. Also the author of Fusion Economics, How Pragmatism is Changing the World. And right beside me, our special guest, but an old friend of Emerald Planet. This is uh, Charles, he goes by Chuck D. Vollmer. He's a author and founder of Jobonomics and the Jobonomics blog. So, Lawrence, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you. Glad to have you with us. Tell us a little bit about this Himalayan and African consensus. What is it? And then we'll go on into the fusion economics, but this is really a very interesting concept of actually bringing Himalayan together consensus. the African continent and the Himalayas. Yes, the Himalayan consensus really evolved from the work of many social entrepreneurs, uh, community workers, NGOs across the region, trying to use business solutions to solve local problems. And from it, there's three core principles. The first is to protect local identity, community, ethnic identity, but through the second principle, that is a local business. And that means bringing finance to people. Uh, finance to communities. Too much of that finance is concentrated at the top. And the third is prioritizing the environment on all things and realizing that protection of the environment, the fight against climate disruption is actually a business opportunity. African consensus really started as, a, is, as an evolution from the Himalayan consensus because so many of the problems are the same. But African consensus added a couple of key points. Food and water are human rights. And also conflict is not caused by religion. Actually, conflict is caused by the disempowerment of people economically and the marginalization of their identity. And from that, all that violence stems. So a better way of dealing with violence is to prevent it and preventing it at the economic level. Well, looking at this whole thing of pragmatic idealism, which is really the theme of this particular show that we're having here right now. Is that, isn't that an oxymoron as far as what you're doing with fusion economics, pragmatic and idealism? Sure, well you know, one of the things is I've worked with a lot of activists, a lot of idealists. If you wanna get something done, you also have to be pragmatic. You have to have skills and resources and use them together. But if you have skills and resources, but your intention is wrong, they can be used wrong. And so bring the two together. And particularly, I think the young, young generation of youth that I see out there, both in Asia, Africa, and right here in America, are not just about self-interest. They're also about trying to save the planet that they themselves know will not be sustainable into another generation at the traje trajectories we're going at right now with consumption and growth. And so there's a whole new shift in values and thinking now, and I really believe that pragmatic idealism is going to be, or idealistic pragmatism will be 
in many ways, the value system of the future. Yeah, looking at uh, elected officials and uh, thought leaders within the community, how do you think and how do you perceive that they'll actually combine this idealism and then make it pragmatic? So it's really a play on the words as far as how you have this featured in your fusion economics and how that's going to impact on local, regional, national, and international uh, governments as far as the, the future of these various economies. Well, look at what we have right now. We have coming out of the leadership in Washington, D.C., you can listen to the rhetoric on both sides of the aisle. You have something that's not about really pragmatism. It's about self-interest. It's not thinking about the greater interest of everyone. It's thinking about the particular interests of individuals or interest groups. It's very different. And we look at idealism versus ideologism. That's quite different. Idealism is trying to achieve something. It's trying to have a vision that's positive for everybody. And you, ideology is being fixed into a set of um, fossilized framework and having to stick to only that framework. And so I think that's where we draw the, the line, the difference between the politicians of today that we hear on TV right now in these debates is what I call self-interest ideology versus what I think many people in America feel at the community level, particularly youth, is a feeling of pragmatic idealism. It's very different. Yeah, and it sounds so, and thank you for sharing that, because the complexity of the 21st century, we can't keep getting stuck. And one of the things is that uh, the politicians will throw at each other your flip-flopper on this idea, or that idea, or 30 years ago you said this. Well, if these people are not changing in 30 years, we don't want to have them elected anyway. I mean, uh, the public should uh, wise up to that whole thing, but as you know, Lawrence, that's all about politics. Uh, Chuck, why don't you ask the next question? Yeah, Lawrence, uh, you mentioned America. Uh, here in America, and in most of the rest of the world, we define uh, capitalism as being kind of rooted in Adam Smith's uh, invisible hand, uh, which translated means if you empower the individual to pursue his self-interest, the spin-offs will benefit uh, society. Uh, would you agree with that or not? Well, I, if you read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, which is a, at the time, it was a radical condemnation of the alliance between then, at that time, trade monopolies and government. He used the term um, invisible hand only once, one time. And it was to talk about communities. It was to talk about self-interest of people to put investment back into their own community. So Adam Smith would be really an icon for diversified localization, not for monolithic globalization. He would be condemning all of the uh, overseas investments that have taken jobs away from America. He'd be talking about keeping those jobs in communities and keeping those communities intact and giving them strength and giving them an economic sustainability that will make those communities to continue to have an identity of their own. That's what Adam Smith was talking about when he said the invisible hand. Uh, Lawrence, looking at your uh, pragmatic idealism and you're talking about communities right now, Emerald Planet as well as Jobonomics really focuses on the community, but all the way down really to the household level. And I noticed through all the images that you've been able to share with us, there's really a lot of these very localized, family-based uh, activities that are going on. How do you infuse this pragmatic idealism at the household and then at the community level in places like Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, all these other uh, areas, these border states, as well as on the African continent? Pragmatic idealism begins with the home and most often it begins with the mother. It's uh, women in many cases that are driving these projects, the leaders of community finance in South Asia and Africa. The pioneers of mobile phone finance are women. They're household women because they want to keep their families and communities intact. They realize that no one's going to come and help them. 
And what they're doing is they're using their own innovation and creativity to drive communities to create financial systems to empower people. And they are the matrons, the wardens, and the drivers of community finance. And so I'm inspired by these people. So I go down to the village level and I'm saying, you know, we're going to bring economic theory to them. No, we need to look at what they're doing to solve real problems with real innovation. And we have to figure out how we can scale that, how we can evolve it to the next level, how we can take it beyond a village into a community, into a state, bring it to national level policy. It's not about academics and politicians sitting in marble buildings coming up with ideas. It's about taking these experiences and turning these into policies that allow people the right to have their own business. And that's why we have to learn from them. We've got to go back to the community. And whether it's in, it's in uh, the Serengeti or whether it's in the Himalayas, right here in America, I'm in Seattle, there's so much going on at the grassroots community level to solve problems. We need to learn from this. I'm here trying to learn what's happening here in America and see how that can be national policy. I know when uh, we host just about a uh, different Chinese delegation a week and from other nations as well, and they come to Washington, D.C., and they want to know about the policies and the change and the applications. And I say, you're really in the wrong place. You need to be at the uh, local, regional, and state levels if you really want to see what's going on in the United States because there's literally tens of thousands of things happening. And that's what we're seeing in these areas that you're working with in the Himalayas and also on the African continent. Uh, going back to this thing of uh, women and youth involved in new businesses and working and supporting their communities, how do you see the dynamic, and we've we got to get off of this very quickly, of that changing societies over the next 5, 10, 15 years? Well, I refer to a lady named Rokhaya who worked with me closely in uh, Senegal. And everybody I met there was an NGO activist or they were starting a social enterprise. And I said to her, how come everyone I meet with you is doing this? And she said, look out here in the street, look at what's happening. You can't live here without wanting to take action and change things. And so I think that her words really represent this whole movement, which is global. And it's also right here in America. The changes are happening in the community. And isn't that how this nation became great? It came up from the community. It was about re-pioneering and people who are innovators. Well, uh, this is uh, Lawrence Brom, who is uh, with us uh, talking about fusion economics. Sitting right beside me is Chuck Vollmer, uh, the uh, author and founder of Jobonomics and the Jobonomics blog. And thank you, viewers, for being with us as we look at this whole concept of fusion economics. Uh, the uh, pragmatic idealism as we create the Emerald Planet. There's one just books at the library. to a machine. I want all the medical treatment available to me. I wouldn't want my family to have to make this decision. My doctor knows what's best for me. An advanced directive is your life on your terms. Talk with your family. Decide what's right for you. Then put it in writing. Documenting my wishes today means my family won't have to make heart-wrenching decisions later. To learn more, visit www.putitinwriting.org. 1,200 American youth run away from their homes every day. The National Runaway Switchboard is here to help. 1-800-RUNAWAY. If you are a runaway, thinking about running away from home, or a parent or guardian concerned about issues facing your child, 
Call us 24 hours a day. 1-800-RUNAWAY. In times of crisis, hope is just a phone call away. 1-800-RUNAWAY. To the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we look for those thousand best practices, technology, service products. And at the same time, we're really looking for the leadership that is making a difference around the globe. Not only the leaders as far as elected officials or uh, local thought leaders, but also people within their households and those that are having a real impact house to house and within their own local communities. And when you have a planet that's going from seven plus billion to almost nine billion people, two billion new people on the planet, there's uh, certainly a, a tremendous brain trust that'll be created by 2050. How are we gonna be able to tap into that brain trust as we move forward and at the same time add all these new people to the planet. We have uh, Lawrence J. Brom who is the uh, co-founder of the Himalayan and African Consensus, also the author of Fusion Economics, How Pragmatism is Changing the World. Sitting right beside me is uh, Charles D. Vollmer, he goes by Chuck, good friend of ours, author and founder of Jobonomics and Jobonomics blog. Lawrence, thank you for uh, being with us. I know you traveled far uh, from Tibet, China, to be in the United States for a few weeks, and we certainly appreciate you sharing your time with us. But tell us a little bit about this diversified localization. That's really one of those themes within fusion economics. Well, we've had decades of monolithic globalization being run down our throat, you know, big corporations going out and really creating a sort of cookie cutter systems. And do people want that? People want, of course, employment. They want to have jobs. They want also their community. They also want to have their own businesses. They don't want to have to have every business has to be listed and has to become a franchise and a chain and a multinational and a Walmart. And so really what this is about is it's about it's really almost counter to Thomas Friedman's view the world is flat the world is not flat the world is round it's diversified it's complex and we should rejoice in the complexity of our cultures and societies and the only way to assure their own sustainability and growth as cultures and communities is to have business there and that business is often going to be individual to the community it's not going to be about franchise it's not going to be about one system. It's not the cookie cutter model. It's going to be something that's local, unique to that community, and most important, owned by that community. I can see why you selected these uh, photographs that you're sharing with us uh, for this particular topic of diversified localization, uh, just to emphasize that the world is definitely not flat. Uh, when you're talking with the monks here, you're probably somewhere around 11 to 12,000 feet above sea level, and those mountains behind you are going up to probably about 15 to 16,000 feet above sea level. But that's really a metaphor for really what you're doing in fusion economics. Tell us a little bit about this localization versus globalization as you're seeing it in Tibet and Bhutan and Nepal and many other countries around the globe. Well, globalization is about the capital market. It's about raising funds and spreading a single franchise or a single concept globally and having everybody buy into it. And that's eating at our diversity. What makes us unique, what makes every culture unique, which makes us people, is our diversity and the richness of that. And that's something we should rejoice in and we have to protect it. And the best way to protect it is to build businesses in communities and let those businesses grow, not to assault them, not to have trade agreements that open up communities and kill the businesses there and break down the culture integrity of those communities. You know, we think about what makes us rich, what makes us happy. It's not only just money, it's also being able to have 
a sense of family, community, knowing your people, having your culture, having your identity. And all of these things are also business opportunities for each community, each neighborhood. And so this is really about how to get capital to people, to protect what they have, and to build that identity. And each identity is unique and needs to be protected. It's not just about monks in Tibet. It's not just about Maasai and the Serengeti. It's also about people in communities like where I am right now. I'm in Seattle. There's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of uniqueness in each community here. People are opening up small bookshops, coffee shops to try and protect that. It's all across America. Even within our country here, we have a huge amount of diversity. And that's something we should rejoice in and we should strengthen. And the only way to do that is to get some of that capital out of the top of those capital markets and get it back down to the communities. That means rechanging our financial system and bringing back a little bit of old fashioned banking, a little bit of old fashioned finance so communities can be empowered and own the finance that they need. It's not about being against business, it's about being against those forces that don't allow people the right to have their own business. Now it's really, it's about uh, being for business, but also being for business within local communities and allowing them to shape their own future and be part of what's happening as we change and add two billion new people to the planet by 2050. Chuck, your question. Yeah, Lawrence, as we talked uh, over lunch the other day, uh, that uh, Jobonomics is involved with uh, a national grassroots movement that deals with uh, international, national, state, and local agencies with an emphasis to create a small and self-employed business at the local le uh, level. Uh, how would you recommend to this audience, uh, how do you motivate these agencies to uh, promote local solutions? Right now we have to employ people. You know, there's about half of America is living on about $1,000. You know, people have about $1,000 to their name. You know, that people are, are locked into debt. People are dependent. Uh, much of the so-called employment that's been created over the past eight years are only part-time jobs. And so really, it's about finding ways to get finance to people so that they can create their own jobs. They can create their own businesses. We were uh, just, you know, the other day we were talking about the conscientious community efforts in Baltimore. This is about creating community businesses, whether that involves something as simple as a person who is your neighbor, you trust them, they can go next door, they can actually uh, be a housekeeper, they can be a babysitter. You can create businesses at a very, very micro level. And that's something to be proud of. It's not something to be looked down on. Not everybody has to be working for Starbucks or for Amazon. It can also be about creating these small businesses. And so in many ways, it's the micro businesses that are gonna employ people more and faster than some of these very, very monolithic, you know, globalized industries. And it's again about how our government can rethink our financial system and get capital to people. All of this quantitative easing, which is debt money, has gone up into the capital markets. It's created huge leveraging of our stock market and huge volatility because of speculation. But none of that has gone to the community and moreover, building a new infrastructure for our communities of renewable and efficient energy that can even create free energy from solar, from geothermal, and from wind is a huge opportunity that can put a lot of people to work. And that opportunity is not being taken. Our government is not doing anything to promote these new fields of innovation that can actually protect our environment and employ people. Chuck, you have a follow-up. Yeah, uh, Lawrence, uh, as uh, we uh, talked again uh, the other day, uh, we agree. 80% uh, of all the businesses now are uh, in the United States are micro and small businesses. Uh, again, how do we get the government to change their focus from government jobs or big business jobs? Of the $17 trillion that was put in the U.S. economy by the Federal Reserve and the, the Treasury Department, Oh, about 95% went into big business and big financial institutions. Mm -hmm. And again, according to you in uh, localization, it would have been nice if 95% would have gone into the local community and micro-business creation. Look, I, I, you know, a few months ago I was in San Francisco and I was at Twitter headquarters, and this is all about debt. It's all about that quantitative easing being pumped into the banks. They are flooded with money. They're throwing it at all kinds of social media 
just tradable commodities. These stocks are like basically trading future soybeans. It's an opportunity in a hope of something in the future. On the street outside, you have so many people unemployed living in the street, their homes taken away from you. This is wrong. We have to readjust the funding. Funding has to get down to community finance. It can be small finance, it can be microfinance, it can be small banks, community cooperatives, but we've got to get money to people at the local level. It's all going into Wall Street, it's all being traded at the top, and it's all going to just a few tech, so-called tech companies or social media companies, or it's being speculated on currencies with the tapering, all of the BRICS currencies began to have volatility because it was all over speculated. And none of that money went down to the community and none of it went into the infrastructure that would allow businesses to exist in that community and give people jobs. Our infrastructure is hopelessly outdated. And so this is, again, it's about money coming down. That's where federal policy has to do. We have to support our local, local banking system and reinvigorate it with new and creative financial mechanisms to give people not just jobs, but to give them the funding to create their own businesses, which can create more jobs. Yeah, in my 88 countries, I've uh, lived, traveled, and worked, uh, Lawrence, and of course, Chuck and I have talked about this many times. Many of these stock markets, really, it's like going to the casino. People are just gambling uh, within these areas. It's not really about investment. It's not really putting money into communities where there's local or regional level. And so we have to get away from that. But looking at social enterprises, describe for us, and we're running out of time again, too much to talk about, uh, but uh, social enterprise, what is it, and how you see that really rejuvenating or uh, expanding businesses within the areas you're working, Tibet, Bhutan, uh, Nepal, places like that, and we have about oh, 50 seconds to do all that. I say every enterprise should be a social enterprise. It doesn't mean this is not just corporate responsibility. We'll give some money to a fund or to a foundation and say that that's the end of the day. It's in your company, having your own conscientious capital, knowing that uh, if you're going to make an investment, if you're going to run a business, it's not only for profit, but it also benefits the community. In turn, that community is your constituency and your consumers. By benefiting them, you're benefiting your business. It's a cyclical economy. And prioritizing the environment, renewable and efficient energy is a good business decision because it's going to lower costs for your business. It's also going to save the planet for the next generation. Lawrence, so you have consumers ten, that. 10 seconds, what do you see for the growth and development of this diversified localization? I think it's the it's going to happen everywhere because the result is people have to take power back into their own hands and the best way to do that is not with a revolution but with a business and Wonderful. that's what people will be doing. Lawrence J. Uh, Brom and sitting right beside me is Chuck Vollmer as we're looking around the planet on this fusion economics as a movement as we create the Emerald Planet. So they say it's a man's world? I don't see anybody's name on it. They were doing their thing, we slowly changed all that. Today, women can do anything men can do. And there's one thing we're even better at. Open enrollment is back. Enroll Virginia wants you to get covered for 2016 and beyond. You have until January 31st to enroll in affordable health care. If you wish to have coverage by January 1st, you must enroll by December 15th. That's less than a month from now. Remember, the penalty for not having health insurance next year is a minimum of $695 per person. Don't think twice about it. To find an enrollment event near you or to get free help with the application, visit our webpage or give us a call. El periodo de inscripción ha comenzado. Enroll Virginia quiere que tú y tu familia tengan cobertura médica este próximo 2016. Tienes hasta el 31 de enero para inscribirte. Si deseas cobertura desde el 1 de enero, debes inscribirte antes del 15 de diciembre. Recuerda que si no tienes cobertura el próximo año, te multarán una suma mínima de $695 por cada adulto. No lo pienses más y visita nuestra página para más información o para ayuda con la solicitud. Hey, Hard, what's this? That's my resignation letter. You're resigning? 
Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be, and you eat stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I, I forgot. I'll, I'll do better. Please, don't quit on me. OK, but remember, it's not what you say. It's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet TV in Washington, D.C. of the United States. And week to week, we are looking around the globe in 144 different nations, looking for what we call the thousand best practices. Those things are the best of the best that are bringing real change to real people in real communities. And we're talking about fusion economics. And we're talking about it from the standpoint of how does it bring change within local communities? But many times is how does it protect these local communities so they can mature, advance, and provide the incomes that they need that in some ways protects them from the globalization that's really the mantra of what's all about as far as economic development around the globe. And we have a real expert that's uh, sharing with us. This is Lawrence J. Brom. He is the co-founder of what's called the Himalayan and African Consensus, the author of Fusion Economics, How Pragmatism is Changing the World. And sitting right beside me is Chuck Vollmer, Charles D., if I can be very formal with him, author and founder of Jobonomics and Jobonomics Blog. And Lawrence, we're glad to have you here. We're glad that uh, China is willing to give you up for a couple of weeks to be in the United States and be able to uh, share with us. But uh, looking at uh, this whole thing, there is two uh, aspects of your book, environmental economics, which that's obvious. We'll talk about that in the middle. But uh, the, the Tao of Shangri-La, how does the Tao, which is really a very ancient uh, philosophical, also it's a mystical or religious uh, ideology that's been developed over thousands of years. How does that really fit into economics in the modern 21st century? And then how do you work that in fusion economics itself? Well, the Tao, it's a Chinese word that means just the way, that's all. It's the way, it's a natural way. And really, economics is quite natural. We're looking at natural limitations of our planet. We can't go beyond those boundaries. We can't stress our resources and our planet any more than we are. Uh, if we do that, nature will react against us. And so, you know, I often say each ethnic group that I visit in the Himalayas all has their sacred mountain. They pray to the mountain because they know that nature will in turn protect them. It's about mutual protection. Protecting our planet protects us. Protecting our resources, our water systems, food security, it's all interconnected. And so that's all about economics and how you make that economics work for food, water security, and health security. And um, if you bring it into a modern context, the Tao or the way is as applicable today in modern America as it once was in ancient China. Yeah, and it's still being used in that society and uh, most Asian nations. Uh, we have this little map here of the mythical Shangri-La because that's all part of this, the Tao of Shangri-La as it relates back to environmental economics. And many people are saying uh, protecting the environment just costs money. It's not really something we're investing in. It's not a way to really protect societies. But I think through what you're doing with your fusion economics, you're really counter to that whole concept. So how is the smart way of investing and combining the environment and economics the way forward as we move uh, through the 21st century towards 2050? Get rid of fossil fuels, get rid of coal. That's a huge business opportunity. Regridding our cities is a great opportunity for business. It is not a threat to business. The only challenge is how to grab that opportunity. 
think of cities where all of those glass windows can each be a solar panel and you're talking about buildings that produce electricity rather than consume it. Now you're talking about free electricity. Think about what one of the biggest costs to every business is electricity, particularly as we're in the internet age, we're using more of it, not less of it. And if that's coming from coal, if that's coming from petroleum, fossil fuels, we are gonna burn out this planet. But the opportunity, you know, in Chinese, they say the word crisis combines two characters. One mm -hmm. is danger, the other is opportunity. Protecting our planet, renewable and efficient energy, water conservation, recycling systems are all business opportunities and they're gonna create a lot of employment, not only for blue collar workers who are putting the gadgets together, but all the way at the PhD level, innovation it's an opportunity for everyone and looking at uh, these uh, young eyes that we're seeing right here what, what you shared with us is that uh, this is really the future of the planet and it's all of these uh, emerging market nations that are still in you know the camp as far as traditional societies and then yet uh, moving forward slowly maybe rapidly uh, towards the technologies of the 21st century and I think this uh, fusion economics, you're talking about really the fusion of technology, innovation, and, re and resiliency, Lawrence, and what it is that you're doing, and uh, good on you for bringing that out. Chuck, next question. Yeah, we were talking about uh, clean energy. Uh, as you uh, are aware, Lawrence, uh, Jobonomics just uh, uh, posted on our website a uh, comprehensive 200-page uh, report on uh, the energy technology revolution where we believe it could create 20 million new jobs in itself in the United States and many more around the world. Our conclusion came is there needs to be some kind of balance of cleaner fossil fuels, renewable energies, and some exotic uh, technologies that are coming online. Would you agree with that assessment or would you just focus on uh, your experience with renewables in uh, places like Tibet and uh, uh, in other uh, emerging markets, uh, or would you think there would be a little different solution for the United States? Well, let's first of all look at the solutions that are underway. When I, you know, on this visit here, I've been meeting with a lot of young entrepreneurs. Uh, they are not social entrepreneurs per se, they are about profit, but what they're doing is they're developing renewable energy systems and solutions. And even if we do not change the trajectory of the technology, where technology is right now, it's just a question of expansion. It's a question of more renewable energy and more consumers of renewable energy that will make that consistently more cost effective, lower costs than fossil fuels. And so far from what we can see, renewable energy systems are creating more jobs for people. There are about one third more jobs than existing fossil fuel systems are offering. So now if we start to add the technology component, the innovation, we start to think about what can be created to make those systems even more efficient. Wow, that's a huge opportunity. And here in America, we've got leadership on that technology but we're not applying it. We're applying it in the wrong ways. We're not applying to what we need to. So the message today should be to turn to Wall Street and say, rather than financing more of this just social media video games, put it behind the technology for the environment. Yeah, you can trade oil derivatives. What about water derivatives? What about the future? Uh, because one day water is gonna be more expensive than oil. Yeah, and that's what they're saying is water is the new oil and that's where we're going in society. And also too, Lawrence, you're absolutely right, is that the cost for uh, solar systems, even wind, now is uh, some 80% less than it was five or six years ago. And the efficiencies are going up, the cost is uh, just really dropping. And the whole thing is that we need to invest in, and provide jobs for people in the local communities because uh, those types of jobs you really can't outsource as you're uh, taking the solar panels to the top of the roof or the backyard or whatever it may be. But uh, the United St Nations uh, Conference on Climate Change, the COP21, you were there. That was in Paris, France. And this really was an earth-changing event as far as commitments by the some 200 nations and territories on the planet to work together 
as we go towards 2050 and uh, bring about more energy efficiency, but also to stop climate change. Which nascent do you feel like is really leading in the renewable areas? And what kinds of things are these renewables uh, directing towards as far as replacing the fossil fuels? Well, you know, the most unlikely candidate to lead is China. You know, it's really, I like to say, is Kung Fu Panda going to save the universe? Maybe it will. It's the biggest consumer of energy, and it's the biggest, uh, you know, creator of carbon emissions right now. But at the same time, the government has realized that high growth is not bringing prosperity and health to its people. That in fact, it's going to create a lot of social political instability because of the pollution and the costs involved in repairing agriculture and water systems and health systems all damaged by the high growth and the carbon emissions that have ruined uh, the country. And so this past April, I was leading the, the, the task force on this, the ecological civilization uh, plan is basically going to involve massive, massive investments into renewable energy. Coal is 70% of China's energy source, and that is enemy number one. So it's going to involve wind, solar, uh, water conservation, red lines to protect natural boundaries, natural areas, marine areas, and of course, a rethink of the construct of growth itself is GDP a good representation of a healthy economy. Many people in the leadership in China say it no longer is, and we need a new construct of growth, a new way of measuring success, which is not just material outputs. Now you're talking about uh, we need to invest in uh, creating new jobs uh, like uh, agriculture, renewable energy, and all that. But how can we use, just like the uh, photograph I had up here, the social media, if we can bring that back up, how can we use that to go back to these more traditional forms, which in many ways have some of the most advanced technologies, but processes, as far as uh, vertical farming and many other ways to create jobs at the local level? What's happening right here in this country? I mean, I was visiting the permaculture movement in California, and here people are actually taking lawns, which use a lot of water just to grow grass and turning them into farms by having juxtaposition of crops. I mean, nature is naturally bountiful, and forests have a juxtaposition of all kinds of different crops which bring in insects rather than having to use pesticides to take them away, which in turn self-fertilize the land. Lawrence, we're going to lose you. Where do you think fusion economics is going to be in the next five or ten years? We're all going to be practicing fusion economics. Back to pragmatism to keep the planet whole. Chuck, thank you for being with us. Uh, Lawrence, thank you for being with us. You did an absolutely fantastic job. And uh, thank you, dear viewers, for being with us in another week as we look at the fusion economics, we're looking at the future of the planet as we create the Emerald Planet.